So I believe that anything over um, hormone replacement therapy, slightly super physiological based on the reference ranges, which are nowadays quite feminist, I would say, anything over that, your endurance will go down. Your stamina will be horrible. I mean, ask any bodybuilder how good their stamina is. Would they be able to do a race with real endurance athletes? Of course not. Victor Steve here with part four of the Optimized Endurance Deep Dive video series, which is part two of the Performance Enhancing Drug segments. In part one of the PEDs, we already discussed cookie cutter hormone replacement therapy, bring your sex hormones and neurosteroids to the top of the reference range, or slightly super physiological. And I believe anything over that will probably just hinder your endurance and overall stamina during long distance sports. So why would you? We also discussed how to optimize or rather yet modulate mitochondrial function with several compounds which are not found on the World Anti-Doping Agency prohibited list of 2023 and neither are they included in the monitoring program of 2023. But let's see in the updated 2024 versions, those will be released sometime in September or October of this year. And when they are released, you can bet your HPTA that I will make an updated WADA approved half natty doping stack of 2024. Stay tuned, subscribe now so you can get it firsthand right when it drops. In this video, I want to discuss optimizing oxygen carrying capacity. Basically, long story short, we're going to talk about erythropoietin EPO, some of the erythropoiesis stimulating agents, which are derivatives of human recombinant erythropoietin. Right? Before we do, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And I'm not just saying that. If this video gets 5,000 to 10,000 views, there should be 5,000 to 10,000 likes as well, right? Make it so. If you want to support the channel, you can do so by joining either the YouTube or Patreon memberships where you can vote for upcoming deep dives or join the weekly Vickers Q&A, which is always on Saturday, so you have a 100% chance to get your questions answered privately before we go public and it turns into a super chat, super flood. Now, what do I mean with erythropoiesis stimulating agents? These are compounds, several classes of drugs, which stimulate the bone marrow to produce red blood cells, and they're generally prescribed in medical conditions to treat anemia caused by end-stage kidney disease or full-blown kidney failure, chemotherapy, major surgeries, or certain treatments revolving around HIV or AIDS. In these situations, many cases, these erythropoiesis stimulating agents are administered either subcutaneous or intravenously. What I'm sure you guys are all familiar and what I want to highlight at the start of this video is that many androgens are also considered erythropoiesis stimulating agents, particularly oxymetalone, anadrol, which is actually medically prescribed to help in particular cases of anemia. Now, the problem is all of these are included on the WADA prohibited list of 2023 and have been on the WADA prohibited list for decades now. So if you want to use testosterone, nandrolone, uh, dianabol, anadrol, halotestin, winstrol, parabolin, that's the trembolone, right? The trembolone sandwich. Provirin, Masterone, Primabolin, Equipoise, Testret, which is methyl testosterone, as well as Androstanolone, which is dihydrotestosterone. Yes, you can use these to improve your overall red blood cell counts, increase your hematocrit, and thus improve the overall oxygen carrying capacity of your blood. But will they improve your endurance? Probably not. All of these compounds, the anabolic energetic steroids, increase your energy consumption, improve mitochondrial function to a certain extent, and thus reactive oxygen species, but we already discussed that in previous videos, your energy demand will go up a lot more compared to the oxygen carrying capacity resulting in optimized endurance. So I believe that anything over um, hormone replacement therapy, slightly super physiological based on the reference ranges, which are nowadays quite feminist, I would say, anything over that, your endurance will go down. Your stamina will be Horrible. I mean, ask any bodybuilder how good their stamina is. Would they be able to do a race with real endurance athletes? Of course not. So, when you look at the medical literature for oxymetolone anadrol, for example, the dosages which are prescribed in cases of severe anemia just bring you back to normal levels of hematocrit and red blood cell counts in serum. That's anywhere between one milligram to five milligram per one kilogram of body weight. So me being around 100 kilos at the maximum dose of anadrol, I should be administered 500 milligrams every single day until I'm no longer anemic. Now imagine if I um, you know, continue that and get my hematocrit up to 
let's say 56 or 60 percent which is already borderline crazy um i'll be a literally a walking tank and the increase in body temperature and the increase in body mass and the overall increased energy demand and the profuse sweating that will come along with that horrible endurance i'm sure of it shin splints lower back cramps and pumps etc so I would leave all of the anabolic androgenic steroids off the table, just solely focus on the cookie cutter hormone replacement therapy, leave it be, unless you're just recovering from surgery or some of the other um, uh, medical conditions that these anabolic steroids are actually prescribed in. So leave them off the table, let's just go over to the erythropoiesis compounds, but before you do, if you're going to change and improve your hematocrit and increase your red blood cell count, let's do an MRI with contrast to see if your heart is functioning correctly. At the same time, let's do a CT angiogram with contrast to see if you have any soft or hard plaque within the coronary arteries or other arteries surrounding your heart. Might as well do a full body MRI to see if you have any issues with blood flow in other organs because the last thing you want is a blood clot and that's a serious risk that comes along with erythropoietic compounds, increased platelets and increased red blood cells and thus increased clotting risk. All right? Does that sound familiar of this day and age? Increased clotting risk, right? Take this to heart and be very, very careful if you want to use these performance enhancing drugs for yourself to improve your overall endurance. So CT scan, MRI, get a sleep apnea diagnosed because your hematocrit might already be high. Maybe the reason why your endurance is terrible at the moment is because you're simply not sleeping throughout the night. So get your sleep apnea diagnosed. Your hematocrit might already be high. And you don't need any of these compounds to bring your hematocrit up. You probably have to get your sleep apnea under control with an APAP or CPAP machine. If you go this route, make sure you can do weekly or bi-weekly blood work to check your complete blood count. That's your hemoglobin levels, which you can actually check at home with an at-home hemoglobin tester. I'll link it down below. You can buy those on Amazon. Check your hematocrit, duh. And check your red blood cell count. Now, if that means that you have to go in for blood work every two weeks but it takes two weeks for you to get the results back or worse a month right that happens also in some countries it takes a month before you get your blood work results back if it takes anything longer than two days it's already outdated so you can't make the appropriate adjustment and get off the epo or some of its derivatives or do a therapeutic blood donation which is also something you need to have on standby somewhere close in case you do go too high right I would say that anything over 56 to 60 percent is too high. A therapeutic blood donation would take anywhere between two to three points off, depending on how much plasma you're donating and if you're doing a power red donation, which returns some of the plasma. Right? This is also something you have, need to have on standby. So again, blood work somewhere close by, which you can do frequently and get the results back in a hurry, and the place where you can do therapeutic blood donations if needed. Supplements or medications to regulate blood viscosity, like fish oil, vitamin E, baby aspirin. You need to be knowledgeable about those and have them on standby or run them continuously. I'm personally, I'm on fish oil and vitamin E in a small dose year round. Supplements or medications to regulate your blood pressure, electrolytes, right? I have separate videos about that and an article on my website. Read it before you start dappling with EPO. Cardotone, the herbal extracts, PDE5 inhibitors like Cialis. ACE inhibitors like C uh, lisinopril, ARBs like telomersartan. Now, we get to an issue here. Telomersartan can actually regulate hematocrit levels and keep that within the reference range. So if you want to, again, it doesn't play out for everybody. And if you're on a lot of uh, boldenone, primabolin, or anadrol, that will certainly not be the case. So all the people with blanket statements saying that telomersartan and you will never have to do a, a blood donation ever again. Guess how many people get into the hospital by just blindly following that advice? Do your blood work, you will see on a heavy cycle, even with 80 milligrams telmosartan per day, you might still have to do a therapeutic blood donation because you get over 56% on your hematocrit, right? Blood work will tell you the final story. Don't listen to these guys saying that you never have to donate by taking an ARB. That's just stupid. Okay, so telmosartan, enalopril, right? These are blood pressure medications, which are actually suppressing your hematocrit and real blood cell count potentially avoid compounds which are known to reduce and modulate hematocrit <laughs> ip6 telmosartan and nanoprobably yet again high dose methylene blue like i mentioned in the previous video the therapeutic dose of methylene blue to improve your overall endurance might be anywhere between 0 0.25 milligrams 
to one milligram per kilo of body weight. So the dosages I mentioned there was between 25 milligrams to 100 milligrams based on the general weight of people who are into optimizing their endurance. But it also means that the longer you take methylene blue at a higher dose, some people actually go anemic. I've had several consultations since then of people who um, you know, were close to anemic and they were taking 100 milligrams of methylene blue to improve their overall performance and uh, mitochondrial function and get you know, all of the benefits of methylene blue, which there are many. And their mitochondria ended up somewhere between 37 to 42% on cycle right so methylene blue has to be respected you need to do your blood work frequently to assess if your hematocrit is coming down so if you want to use erythropoietic compounds i would say limit the methylene blue to a you know a, a productive dose of let's say five milligrams per day supplements i mentioned in part one to increase oxygen carrying capacity right that's a b100 complex some of the b vitamins help with the red blood cell production as well as iron ferrous bisglycinate chelate also known as ferrochel or vitamin C and copper, right? I explained everything in the previous videos. Now, some of these erythropoiesis stimulating agents might go well with anti-hypoxia medications, which I discussed in part one of the PED segments, right? Bemethyl, hypoxin, and amoxipine, right? Or look into these combinations. I've talked to several athletes who combined erythropoietic compounds with bemethyl or hypoxin or amoxipine, and they said they got great results. Now, Personally, I've never used anything like EPO or some of its derivatives. So I had to do a lot of research and discuss some of these protocols with my athletes. And it also means that I'm not going to go into exact protocols on what you need to do because I don't exactly know what you're doing on the other end of this YouTube video. So we're going to go with the medical dosages, which are approved in particular medical conditions. Um, you might have to go a little bit higher or you might have to go a little bit lower. But if you don't have access to frequent blood work, CT scans and MRIs, then I would just advise you to stay clear, right? These compounds are meant to be respected. It's next level performance enhancing drug use because dying of a blood clot is quite acute. If you go hypoglycemic from using insulin a little bit too much, you can eat your way out of it, but you can't eat your way or drug your way out of a blood clot, right? So guys, please proceed with caution Still, I want to present this information to you so you know what's on the table if you want to improve your overall endurance. So let's get started with erythropoietin, EPO, unfortunately included in the prohibited list since 1990, I believe, albeit that the first tests were available from 2000 onwards, and the first victim of WADA that was using erythropoietin to improve one's endurance, in cycling, of course, uh, failed the doping test in 2001. So it's found under the peptide hormones, growth factors, and related sub substances and mimetics. One, erythropoietins. And there's all of the compounds which we're going to discuss in this video are actually classified there. That's erythropoietin, EPO, as well as methoxy polyethylene glycol epoietin beta, also known as Sura or Mersura, and derbopoietin, D-EPO. All of those three we're going to discuss in this video, all three included on the prohibited list. So proceed with caution if you're a tested athlete. Erythropoietin is produced through human recombinant technology. Recombinant human erythropoietin is available, also known as hematopoietin or hemopoietin. I couldn't find the molecular formula, so if you can find it, you know, the amount of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms which are contained within EPO, what I was able to piece together is that the molecular weight of EPO is 30.4 kilodalton, so that's 50% higher than the kilodalton molecular weight of growth hormone fluctuating anywhere between 20 to what was it, 24 kilodaltons. Classification of EPO, of course, is uh, erythropoiesis stimulating agents. The half life depends on the administration route. Intravenous, the half life is anywhere between 6.1 to 10.9 hours. And if you administer it subcutaneously, the half life is anywhere between 8.7 to 30.1 hours. Again, we're going with the scientific literature here. The effective medical dosages, guys, in case of Chemotherapy is 150 IUs EPO per one kilogram of body weight subcutaneous three times per week. For coronary kidney failure, that's anywhere between 50 IUs to 100 IUs per one kilogram of body weight intravenous or subcutaneous three times per week. And anemia from surgery, 300 IUs per one kilogram of body weight sub Q 10 days before the surgery. So kind of front loads if they are going to expect that you're going to undergo a lot of blood loss during surgery. Then on the day of the surgery, for four consecutive days, 
after surgery, again, another 300 IU per one kilogram of body weight subcutaneously. Now, there are several biosimilar products which are available as recombinant human EPO. Those are epoetin alpha, epoetin beta, and epoetin zeta. These are biosimilar because the amino acid structure is the same as, um, you know, endogenously produced erythropoietin, but the carbohydrate structure, this is why the molecular weight is so high, 40% of EPO is actually carbohydrate. Certainly not ketogenic diets approved. It might even kick you out of ketosis if you start IVing a boatload of EPO, whether that's the alpha, beta, or zeta variant, because again, containing a decent amount of carbohydrates. But then again, a ketogenic diet isn't really good for endurance. You would need some carbohydrates and maybe some aldronate and maybe some insulin to shuttle those carbohydrates in for mitochondrial uh, function and ATP synthesis. And then you provide all of the oxygen with EPO or uh, similar biosimilar products. It's all starting to make sense now. Okay, so what are the functions of EPO? This is the same for all of the compounds which we're going to discuss in this video. Increase oxygen carrying capacity by increasing your red blood cell count and overall hematocrit and thus improving one's endurance if you're not hindering your endurance with anabolic energetic steroids or some of the other compounds which can lower your endurance. Improved aerobic performance, enhanced recovery, which is slightly speculated because again, EPO improves or might improve the recovery process by aiding in repairing damaged tissues and replenishing oxygen stores through the increased red blood cells. Keep in mind, besides the increased oxygen carrying capacity, delivering oxygen from the lungs into metabolically active tissues, preferably skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle then produces CO2, carbon dioxide. And guess how that gets back to the lungs for you to exhale it? Red blood cells, baby. So the increased red blood cells is not only the delivery of oxygen, also the removal of metabolic waste products, specifically carbon dioxide. So the increased likelihood for acidosis within skeletal muscle now also goes down, especially if you start combining that with compounds like citrulline malate, beta alanine to help with the acid buffer, or uh, baking soda, sodium bicarbonate, which we discussed in part one and two of the enhanced endurance deep dive video series. All right, so all of this can be readily combined. This is also one of the reasons why some of the more advanced professional bodybuilders tend to use a little bit of EPO here and there, but these practices are generally kept under wraps, not to be talked about, total state secrets. But I do know that there's some professional and amateur bodybuilders out there that dabble a little bit with EPO, albeit that these guys are living the lifestyle 100% and they have access to all of the blood work uh, places and can do therapeutic blood donations and do the occasional MRI or CT scan just to make sure that they don't have any plaque or obstructions in their blood vessels, right? These guys are highly on point and they spend an arm and a leg to stay healthy while using EPOs and other performance enhancing drugs. So um, again, these kinds of compounds come with a laundry list of prerequisites because blood, blood clots, stroke, cardiovascular problems, right? Other potentially life-threatening complications are all serious side effects of EPO. Um, again, make sure that you check your serum hematocrit, red blood cell count, platelets, and hemoglobin every two weeks throughout the entire course that you might be using recombinant human erythropoietin, whether that's the alpha, beta, or zeta variants. Now, another variant of erythropoietin is, uh, like I alluded earlier, methoxypolyethylene glycol epoetin beta, also known as Sera or Mercera, included in the WADA prohibited list. Uh, I couldn't find the molecular formula, unfortunately. So if you happen to know, you would like to contribute to the contents of this video, let us know in the comment section the amount of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms, and whatever else this Sera or Mercera contains. I do know the molecular weight, 60 kilodaltons. So that's twice as heavy as recombinant human erythropoietin, RHEPO. Um, why is that? Well, the Sera, Mercera, contains methoxypolyethylene glycol and thus has a much higher molecular weight because this uh, methoxypolyethylene glycol, besides some modifications to the carbohydrate structure, um, this gives it a very long active life. The half-life is 130 to 137 hours. So that's what? Um, let's say an average 10 times higher, depending on the administration routes over a common human EPO. And it also means that you only have to inject this uh, sera or mercera at 0.6 microgram per one kilogram of body weight or up to 1.2 micrograms per one kilogram of body weight, subcutaneous or intravenously, once every two weeks, but preferably 
monthly. This is only in the context of chronic kidney disease. Personally, I've never talked to anybody who's used this compound. I do know that it's on the market. I do know that it's prohibited. And of course, you know, if you're looking for compounds that you shouldn't be using, the World Anti-Doping Agency prohibited list is probably the best source to get inspired. So this is only used in a case of chronic, chronic kidney disease. And just like with erythropoietin, you know, the main biological functions and effects is increased red blood cell production, improved oxygen delivery, and the corrections for anemia in particular medical conditions. So, um, you know, it's basically the same as EPO, albeit a longer lasting version. And then the last one I want to discuss, darbopoietin alpha, also known as Aranesp, also on the prohibited list. So let's not waste too much time on that. The molecular formula is on the screen. I was able to find it. The molecular weight of darbopoietin alpha is 40 kilodaltons. So not as heavy as Sera Mercera, but about 50% heavier than a recombinant human EPO. And that's because darbopoietin alpha is a re-engineered form of erythropoietin containing five amino acid changes. So there's no changes in the carbohydrate structure, but in this context, the amino acids are changed and thus the half-life is also significantly longer. Depending on the administration route, it could be anywhere between 48.8 hours to 69.6 .6 hours after a single administration. The effective medical dosages for chronic kidney failure are between 0.45 micrograms to 0.75 micrograms per one kilogram of body weight, either subcutaneous or intravenous, once per week or once every two weeks. And for cancer chemotherapy, that goes as high as 2.25 micrograms per one kilogram of body weight, either subcutaneous or intravenously, once weekly, or 500 micrograms sub-Q every three weeks. So those are pretty high dosages, right? Biological functions, the exact same as erythropoietin, alpha, beta, or zeta, or the Sura or Mercera with the impronounceable long name, right? Increased blood blood cell count, improved oxygen delivery, and enhanced aerobic capacity. All these three have a laundry list of prerequisites. Uh, you really need to do your due diligence before you start using them and do a ton of research on how they're metabolized and um, you know what other stuff you need to pay extra special attention to that I might omit from this video to you know be respectful of your time still. Do your research before you start dabbling. And before we close it off, keep in mind that the erythropoietin and some of its variants are partially metabolized by the D-peptidyl peptidase 4 enzymes, which are found on the cell membranes of most of the tissues of the body. These metabolize growth factors like IGF-1, insulin, incretins like GLP-1 or GIP, right, which help to blunt appetite, otherwise and are cofactors in insulin secretion. So in most cases, uh, D-peptidyl peptidase 4 enzyme inhibitors are prescribed in cases of diabetes and help with blood glucose management. So you would think that these compounds, these drugs, the glypton medications, would increase erythropoiesis as an erythropoiesis stimulating agent, but an increased hematocrit or blood cell count or hemoglobin level within serum is not a known side effect of these D-peptidyl peptidase 4 enzyme inhibitors. So don't use these in an attempt to increase your hematocrits. However, it is a common side effect of sodium glucose type 2 inhibitors, whether that's empagliflozin or some of the other SGLT2s. Keep in mind that these kinds of medication with prolonged exposure can actually increase hematocrit with 2 to 4%. Is that because uh, SGL2 inhibitors can improve diuresis or is that because they act on the kidneys and thus produce more erythropoietin, which is going to act in the bone marrow to increase red blood cell count and thus improve hematocrit between two to four points. That I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's something worth looking into, albeit that you're losing a lot of sodium and glucose by using these compounds as well. So that's probably not a worthy trade-off if you're looking to increase your endurance and you're using a lot of carbohydrates and sodium in the process to optimize endurance and stamina in long distance sports, right? I don't think that's a suitable way to go for, but in Russia, apparently since 2004, people have been inhaling xenon and oxygen mixture gases to uh, increase uh, the activation of uh, HIF-1 alpha, which leads to increased production of erythropoietin and thus improved performance because the red blood cell count and hematocrit tends to go up after that. Um, again, do a little bit of research because xenon and oxygen mixture gases uh, probably have some deleterious effects 
also. And then there's, of course, melanotan too, which anecdotally can increase hematocrit and red blood cell count quite dramatically, but this is typically observed only in enhanced bodybuilders who also use anabolic androgenic steroids. There is some overlap on the melanocortin receptors and trenbolone, for example, which is known to increase adrenocorticotropic hormone quite dramatically, right? Raising cortisol levels downstream, albeit that it inhibits the cortisol receptors to a certain extent and thus uh, prevents catabolism. There's some overlap regarding its tanning effect between melanotan 2 and trenbolone, but also some overlap regarding its increase in hematocrit and red blood cell count. You generally don't see this in individuals who um, just run melanotan 2, let's say half a milligram, one milligram per day to increase their tan. Their hematology doesn't really change that much. But in men that run testosterone replacement therapy, for example, cookie cutter HRT, like I mentioned at the start of the previous video, there's no clinical evidence that melanotan 2 can increase hematocrit and red blood cell count in drug-free individuals, general population. But you see it anecdotally in enhanced bodybuilders or fitness enthusiasts using steroids that hematocrit can go up quite dramatically. So keep this in mind. You might have to go on HRT plus melanotan 2 if you want to increase your uh, overall hematocrit and red blood cell count to improve your stamina and endurance. But the problem is HRT is, of course, not WADA approved. And even though melanotan 2 isn't on the prohibited list, without some steroids in the mix, you probably won't see any dramatic changes on your hematocrit and red blood cell count. So keep that in mind. It's still something worth exploring if you want to keep it WADA compliant. And besides that, there's always blood doping. This is really used right, through um, you know, the extraction of red blood cells the, those are being concentrated, centrifuged, and then reintroduced. The day of the competition, that's being done, increasing a hematocrit with bioidentical red blood cells that you produce yourself, albeit at an earlier time point. Um, reintroducing them might increase your hematocrit and overall red blood cell count to superphysiological levels. There's a hyperbaric oxygen chambers. Those are commonly used by endurance athletes. You simply sleep in the hyperbaric chamber, right? The pressure goes down, the oxygen content of the air goes down and thus red blood cell production goes up to kind of compensate for that. You know, look at the reference ranges of people that live at altitude. Some people, some reference ranges go even as high as 60%, right? Depending on the altitude in the country and a medical field that you find yourself in. And then there's always altitude masks, which are very, very cumbersome. I would rather sleep in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. But again, people are using this left and right, especially in MMA. So there's a lot of options you can look into besides these drugs, which are not uh, approved by WADA or USADA. Right? Blood doping, very hard to detect. This is one of the reasons why the um, IV administrations are prohibited, albeit that you can basically do IVs anywhere. Um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, right? Altitude masks, solid alternatives if you combine that with some of the over-the-counter supplements, which we discussed in part one and two of the Enhanced Endurance Deep Dive video series. Right, If you haven't watched that, I'll link them at the end of this one. In the next part, part three of the PEDs, part five of the deep time video series, we're going to discuss optimizing cardiac function, right? We discussed this in the context using over-the-counter supplements, it's a Tori, Nubicanol, et cetera. Uh, but now we're going to talk about beta blockers, trimethazine, and some of the stimulants. And the list of stimulants, which are either approved or non-approved, is very, very long. So I'm going to stick to the basics, right? Otherwise, that video is going to be two hours in duration. And many of the stimulants which are found on the prohibited list, most of us don't really want to use or we can't source them anyway. So list your favorite stimulant down below so I don't go over it, right? Whether that's approved or non-approved, let me know. I'll try to include it. I'll do my best to do the research. Just give me some time to prepare for it because I haven't used everything that's on the prohibited list myself. For now, we're out of time. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. My sponsors and affiliates, they're all there. And if they're not there, you can probably find them on my website, vigorsteve.com. Bookmark that site. One of the articles goes over all of the compounds and over-the-counter supplements, which I regularly discuss on this YouTube channel. So again, vigorsteve.com is where the magic starts to happen. And perhaps including erythropoiesis stimulating agents, Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve, Vigor Screw. You guys know what to do. A front double bicep for you guys. I think my hematic is like 42% coming off uh, anabolic energetic steroids seven months ago. Um, but let's see how long that will last, right? As soon as I'm on a little bit of TRT, hematic all the way to 52%, and hopefully keeping it there for optimized endurance from cookie cutter 
HRT. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.